it looked a little outdated to me, but I didn't want to hurt grandpa's feeling. So I told him I would take it with me and read it the first chance I got. The Essential Book Young Lads. There was just enough room to fit it in my bag and I figured the more stuff piled on top of the Frenchies, the better. When mom dropped me off at school this morning though, I realized I was seriously unprepared for this trip. Everybody else had a ton of gear and I felt like I had underpacked. After all our stuff was loaded onto the bus, the bags took up at least half the space. That meant we had to double up on seats which made the ride to Hard Scrabble Farm feel a lot longer than it should have. When we finally got there and drove through the main entrance, I was pretty relieved, but the last stretch was brutal because it was a dirt road. When we got off the bus, a group of kids from another school was just leaving and they looked like they couldn't be getting out of there soon enough. A kid in the back was holding a handwritten sign that didn't make any sense to me, beware of Silla Scratch. A couple of my classmates seemed pretty freaked out when they saw it. A boy standing next to me said his older brother went to Hard Scrabble Farm a few years back and told him all about Silla Scratch. Apparently, this little scratch guy was a farmer who lived at Hardscrabble Farms a long time ago, but then the county came in and kicked him off his land. Another kid chimed in and said he heard Silla Scratch went to live in the forest where he survived by eating slugs and berries. Then Melinda Henson said she heard he went crazy and grew his fingernails really long. See, I could have done without the part about the long fingernails because that sort of thing really gives me the willies. One of our chaperones, Mr. Haley, said that when his class went to our scribble farm, a kid named Frankie came across Silla Scratch shacks in the wood. After Frankie saw it, he was never the same. Anyone who hadn't heard of Silla Scratch before knew about him now because the story spread like wildfire. I found the whole Silla Scratch thing disturbing. I guarantee you, if anyone told me there was a deranged farmer prowling the ground of Hard Scrabble Farm, I could have just stayed home and taken my chance with Dad. After we were done unloading the bus, we brought our stuff down to the main lodge, which was a giant log cabin with a bunch of long tables inside. The person in charge was Mrs. Graziano, and once everyone sat down, she gave a speech about the camp rules. There were a bunch of them, but the one she said was most important was that boys and girls are not allowed to visit each other's cabin for any reason. Mr. Griziano said this was her 19th year coming to Harscrabble Farms and she wasn't going to put up with any nonsense from anybody. Then she had the chaperones go through everyone's back to make sure nobody was trying to sneak in any junk food or electronics. A few kids got busted with stuff in the bags. Mike Barrows had a pound of jelly beans in his backpack and Denae Higgins got caught trying to smuggle in a giant chocolate chip cookie. I was really glad I had left those candy bars back home, but I was a little worried about the chaperones might confiscate my baby wipes. Once Mr. Jones got a whiff of my bag, though he didn't go digging any further. After that, we had lunch, which was hot dogs, baked beans, stuffed peppers. There weren't any other choices, so if you don't like any of those things, you were out of luck. When lunch was over, the chaperones told us to scrape our leftovers into a giant pot. I hadn't touched my stuffed peppers, so I dumped the whole thing. I asked Mr. Haley why we put our leftover in a pot instead of the trash can. He said at Hard Scramble Farm, no food goes to waste, and everything we didn't eat for this meal is put into a stew for the next one. He said it was the same way when he came to this camp as a kid and they still use the exact same pot. That means there can be leftovers from 30 years ago in that thing. After lunch, Mrs. Grazianos and the female chaperones took the girls to the other side of the camp to go to their cabins. Mom had actually wanted to volunteer as a chaperone last minute, but she wasn't comfortable leaving many with Roderick and Grandpa. That kind of stinks though because she couldn't fed me inside information from the girl's side of camp. You don't stand a chance with Lauren but Chloe, thank you, 
have a cute butt. <laughs> Us guys stayed back in the cafeteria to get our cabin assignment. Most of the groups were kids who hang out together at school, but each cabin seemed to have one kid who didn't belong. The school must have decided to spread all troublemakers out so there wouldn't be more than one in any cabin. The only group that had more than one troublemaker was Mrs. Nazi group, but Mrs. Nazi works as a prison guard, so I guess they figured he could handle it. Since I registered late, I got put with the group of leftovers, which included Roly. I was glad I got assigned to the same cabin as Roly, but I wasn't happy his father was a chaperone. Mr. Jefferson has never really been a big fan of mine, and I wasn't looking forward to be cooped up with him for a whole week. It was pretty clear whoever had our cabin last didn't bother cleaning up after themselves. One kid in my group, Julian Trimble, seemed to be taking the situation pretty hard because his lips started to quiver as soon as we walked through the door. I was kind of surprised Julian decided to come on this trip because I was guessing he's never been away from his parents overnight before. Julian was always the kid who made a big scene every morning during drop-off time at school. Once in second grade, he had such a strong grip on his mom that the wise principal had to come down to peel them apart. I figured Julian decided to go on this trip on his own, but when I remember the scene at the school this morning, I started to wonder if his mom had actually tricked him into it. Everybody started picking out their bunks, and that's when I found out why everyone had such big bags. I had just assumed the batting wouldn't be taken care of, but I guess that was too much to hope for at a place like this. The closer thing that I had a pillow was my hoodie, which already smelled like Roderick's ham sandwich. It was hard finding a mattress without any weird stains on it. I picked up a top bunk because I couldn't risk being underneath Julian in case he wet the bed. Unfortunately, Ms. Jefferson slid into the spot right underneath me, so now Roly Dad was my bunk mate. After we finished unpacking our stuff, we went down to the activities areas to do some team building exercises. The first thing we did was a trust fall, where one guy would fall backwards and everyone else was supposed to catch him. I guess the point was to show how our teammates have our backs, but Jordan Lankley did his fall while the rest of us were still working out where to stand. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson showed us how to form two lines facing each other and then make an head by grabbing each other's wrists. So when Jefferson Swamson got up on the platform, we thought we were ready for him. But Jeffrey is a big boy and his way made Rooley and Gareth Grimms collapse and smash into each other. Gareth was missing one of his front teeth and <laughs> everyone got down on their hands and knees to look for it. Then Emilio Mendoza found the tooth in Rolly's forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jefferson told Emilio to run down and get the nurse who brought Gareth a damp washcloth to stop the bleeding. But she couldn't pull the tooth out of Rolly's forehead because it was really logged in there. Mr. Jefferson called his wife to come and pick Rolly up and take him to get it checked out. I don't know if she ended up going to a doctor or a dentist because I have no idea what you even do for that sort of thing. So Mr. Jefferson was stuck chaperoning a bunch of kids who weren't his. He had us do all these exercises that were supposed to teach us how to work together as a team. But all they really did was show us how bad we were at it. We did one activity bucket brigade where we had to make a relay line to bring water from the river all the way to our cabin. The first guy filled up his bucket and then poured it in the next guy's bucket and so on. But we spilled so much water along the way that by the time we got the cabin, there was almost nothing left to put in the metal tub we were supposed to fill. <laughs> we realized if we were ever going to finish the activity, we need to find a better way to fill the tub. So we wrung out our sweaty clothes.